welcome everyone. We're just going to give folks a um, a chance to come in, uh, come in the room, um, and in, in a minute or two, I'll I'll get started and, and launch into my spiel. Nice to see some uh, frequent flyers out there uh, in the audience and some good friends as well. Although I can't really see you, I can just see your name popping up in the um, in the participant list. All right, it looks like we're starting to stabilize in terms of people coming in the room. Um, I'm gonna launch into my spiel. It's a second before we um, before we get to the the poets. Um, uh, yeah, I'm gonna. It looks like it's picking up a little bit, so I'm gonna let some people come in, come in, and then we'll get started soon. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to a special National Poetry Month edition of the Kitchen Table Reading Series. Um, this is our sixth episode. Um, this is uh, one of my last poetry events for the month, and I'm, I'm happy to be sharing it with you and our, and our readers. It's been a great um, uh, National Poetry Month, and I, I think that's due in large part to uh, Amanda Gorman's performance at the um, inauguration. So all praise to Amanda Gorman. Um, also, I feel like spring and change are in the air, and it's felt uh, good lately to, to leave the house, taking all the necessary precautions, and I, I hope you are all in a good space as, as well. Uh, once again, we have a talented lineup of poets for you, including um, Aaron Casado Kamura, Andres Serpa, and, and Krista Franklin. Um, before we arrive at our readers, our regular attendees know that we start with a special uh, keep the lights on section. Um, the spirit of this series is non-commercial, um, but if you want poetry, and judging by my experience this month, Americans are hungry for, for poetry, um, we have to make sure that the poets stay fed. So during the reading, I'll throw a list of um, recent poetry collections from the poets in the chat, and I do hope that you'll buy a, a copy of, of their work at your local bookstore. Also, giving the gift of, of poetry has the positive byproduct of making you look more intelligent and well-read. Not that you're not that, but you know, just to ensure that folks think that. Um, I'm also indebted to the Solstice MFA program, my spiritual poetry home away from home. Uh, Solstice gener generously allows me to use their Zoom account for webinars. Um, and that generosity to me is indicative of the greater uh, generosity of the spirit that pervades uh, the Solstice program. We're a group of committed, diverse writers um, who push each other to perfect our craft in a variety of genres from children's lit to, to nonfiction to poetry. If you're interested in exploring your writing skills in, in that sort of supportive, close-knit community, I do hope that you'll, you'll check us out. Um, I think we have a residency coming up this summer and then another one uh, will start in the, in the winter. All right, uh, let's get into the, into the poetry. The poems that I'll read to start and end the reading um, are poems that help keep me in mind, um, help me keep in mind that which is good and important, even as I get distracted sometimes by that which is detrimental and, and trivial. So this first poem is by the poet Aricelis Gourmet, and it is Elegy. And it starts with a, a little epigraph. What to do with this knowledge that our living is not guaranteed? Elegy. Perhaps one day you touch the young branch of something beautiful and it grows and grows despite your birthdays and the death certificate. 
and it one day shades the heads of something beautiful or makes itself useful to the nest. Walk out of your house then, believing in this. Nothing else matters. All above us is the touching of strangers and parrots, some of them human, some of them not human. Listen to me. I am telling you a true thing. This is the only kingdom, the kingdom of touching, the touches of the disappearing things. All right, um, let's hear these poets that we came to hear. Feel free to light up the, the chat, which I, I see we already have some chats rolling in uh, with appreciation before, during and after uh, the poets read. I was just, before uh, we opened it up, I was saying to the poets that reading on a webinar can be a lonely experience. You're kind of speaking into the void because we can't see all of your smiling faces. Um, so let us know that you're out there. Um, first up, I, I read with Aaron a couple weeks ago, so I know that you're in for something special. Uh, I was um, on the editorial board of uh, Slappering Hole Press, which put out his most recent book. I'll put the title in, in the chat. Um, so I'm really excited to have Aaron Casado Kimura with us today, and he is, is coming in from Bloomfield, Connecticut. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Solstice MFA. Um, I'm very happy to be here and very honored to be reading with Andre and Krista. I'm going to uh, read just eight poems today, uh, four of my own, and then four from uh, one of my favorite poets, uh, Jane Kenyon. Now the poets, the poems of mine that I'm going to be reading um, are from my new chat book, uh, Uba Sute, which was published by Slappering Hall Press in March. And I'm going to be trading off with Jane, uh, one poem of my own, uh, and in response, a poem from Jane, one poem of my own, one poem from Jane, and so forth. Uh, this first poem that I'm going to read is a poem about my father. Uh, he was a physical therapist by profession, but he was actually born and raised on a farm. Uh, so in his spare time when he wasn't working, he spent it all um, out in the garden in his garden. Um, in this poem, I mentioned Executive Order 9066. And the many of you will remember that's the executive order that was signed into action uh, by Franklin Roosevelt, uh, which led the way to the incarceration of 120,000 Japanese Americans during World War II. Uh, another thing that I'll mention is that there's a word in this poem that I use that I didn't know before I wrote this poem. And it's the word gnomon, G-N-O-M-O-N. And you all know what a sundial is, right? A lot of people have decorative sundials out in their garden. Well, the gnomon is that needle that stands upright on the sundial. So when the sun crosses the sky, uh, it casts the shadow off the needle and you can tell the time. This poem is entitled, Hand Telling. He chuffs his shovel into soil with the sole of his right boot, more dried mud than leather. He balances full weight, both feet on the shoulders of the shovel. Gloved hands rocking the handle, blade prying packed clay. He levers a clod, turns it, hacks it, repeats down an eight-foot row to his right. The smell of earth takes him back to San Gabriel, the family farm of rented acreage before the war, before Executive Order 9066. Eviction, incarceration, after tilling four beds, he plants the shovel upright like a gnomon marking time, rests on the pine bench under the pin oak. He takes a swig from a can of cores, surveys his garden, never needs to look beyond his fence.
And this is the poem by Jen, Jane Kenyon entitled, The Suitor. We lie back to back, curtains lift and fall, like the chest of someone sleeping. Wind moves the leaves of the box elder. They show their light undersides, turning all at once like a school of fish. Suddenly, I understand that I am happy. For months, this feeling has been coming closer stopping for short visits like a timid suitor. Uh, my next poem is about my parents when they first got married before my sister and I came along. And this poem is called The Hardest Part. The fire truck siren downstairs raided the air of my mother's dreams. She'd scream in her sleep, my father told me, even after we married. More than a decade past the Second World War, for him, American concentration camps, for her, the firebombing of Tokyo, they moved into a San Francisco apartment that rented to Japs a one-bedroom walk-up above the Post Street fire station. They painted their bathroom black. It was in style then. Shelved books, unboxed a new rice cooker, watered a shrub of Japanese maple, potted for their future garden. When the station got a call in the middle of the night, the rumble of the overhead door crumbled into the wreck that was once her home. Swirling lights flashed ancient trees into flames through the thin silk curtains of her eyelids. No warning, no drill, no cover. My father stilled her body, his broad hand on her shoulder or hip as they lay in the dark, listening to the slowing of her breath. The hardest part of those nights, he said, was waiting, sometimes hours, for the truck and the men to come back. This is the poem, Coming Home at Twilight in Late Summer by Jane Kenyon. We turned into the drive and gravel flew up from the tires like sparks from a fire. So much to be done, the unpacking, the mail and papers, the grass needed mowing. We climbed stiffly out of the car, the shut off engine ticked as it cooled. And then we noticed the pear tree, the limbs so heavy with fruit they nearly touched the ground. We went out to the meadow, our steps made black holes in the grass, and we each took a pear and ate and were grateful. Uh, the next poem is a poem uh, about when my father passed away. <clears throat> and the title is in Jammed. When you're the son, it doesn't matter if you're the youngest. Call the hospice nurse to the house to pronounce your father dead. Close the bedroom door Give your mother the privacy she needs to tell him he left too soon. When the nurse phones the funeral home, ask your sister to take your mother to his garden to grieve with the ginkgo, pine, and pin oak. Don't let her see the dark-suited men, the gurney, the body bag, 
Try not to feel bad that your father's wearing only a diaper. As he's wheeled out his front door, loaded into the back of a hearse, don't think about the neighbors watching. Keep moving. Break down the hospital bed, the one delivered this morning, so your mother won't have to smell it. Finally, forgive yourself for lifting him into that bed, crushing his lungs, ending him an hour sooner, maybe two. Cleaning the Closet by Jane Kenyon. This must be the suit you wore to your father's funeral, the jacket dusty after nine years, and hanger marks on the shoulders, sloping like the lines on a woman's stomach after having a baby, or like the downturned corners of your mouth as you watch me fumble to put the suit back where it was. And I have two more poems for you. Um, this next poem is one of my own and it's entitled Owl. Morning ghost, white burnt umber. I heard your hoot in my sleep. You sweep across the road, talon a vole at the oak's foot. Night eyes stare back, bronze beak tears open the dawn. Caught in sunrise, you dissolve into shadow. I walk the long driveway from the mailbox, riffle through yesterday's junk, open a land's end catalog. There's my mother's white wool sweater. She gets more mail than I do, though she's never lived here and is long gone. Uh, thank you to Ian once again in Solstice MFA and thank you everybody here today for uh, coming out to hear us read. This poem is one of uh, uh, Jane Kenyon's most well-known poems and it's entitled Otherwise. I got out of bed on two strong legs. It might have been otherwise. I ate cereal, sweet milk, ripe, flawless peach. It might have been otherwise. I took the dog uphill to the birch wood. All morning, I did the work I love. At noon, I lay down with my mate. It might have been otherwise. We ate dinner together at a table with silver candlesticks. It might have been otherwise. I slept in a bed in a room with paintings on the walls and planned another day just like this day. But one day, I know it will be otherwise. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Um, it's always a good day for a, a Jane Kenyon poem. I appreciate that. She's such an Im important poet um, to me. I love her dis uh, distillation, how she just gets down to the, to the essence of it. Um, yeah, I, I was I was wondering how you're going to fit eight poems in, and then you then I remember Jane Kenyon, but she 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 gets it down, um, so I I need no word. And then in your own poem, that line, no no warning, no drill, no cover, really um, hit home for me as resonating beyond uh, the subject of what you were talking about um, in the poem. Thank you so much. Um, next up, we have uh, Andres Serpa. I'm uh, Andres is in Brooklyn. But I'm uh, also very happy to say that as of September, uh, Andres will be uh, my colleague at my regular gig in the English department at, at Rye Country Day School. Um, I don't think he knows this yet in, until this moment, but I'm handing over the poet laureate reigns of Rye Country Day School to Andres next year. Uh, all right, Andres, come on down. Thanks, Dia. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, thanks everyone for 
coming out. I really appreciate it. Um, it's a nice way to spend a Sunday and to listen to poems. So the first poem I'm going to read um, is titled Late Work. Um, and it's from a book that I'm working on. I feel compelled to give you an ending, a promise of hope, to move against despair, even if the act is simple as falling in love. In other city, a long day casting shadows in the park. I lost something and can't get over the fact. The most powerful world was the world of destruction and high. And or, I ran through the cane fields in splendor. When the interior puzzled with the physical world, I cut myself down. The way and I became brothers, not blood, not sugar, not rust, snow in Kalichosa, in the too soon and always, I held the machete, I built myself a life. And um, I guess I should have said this before the poem, but Kalichosa is a, a town in Puerto Rico. Uh, where my family's from and uh, you know this next poem is by cd wright and it's from her first book called the uh, the gospel translated back into tongues um which i think is a i'm really lucky to have that book um and it's a rainy day poem i expected it to rain today so jazz impressions in the garden Dark as a cow, it's a downpour. Mud on every soul in the vestibule. A boy can lean on his oar, drift out of this world. The time has come now for the cold eyes of the rain and the writer to bear down. This could be Harlem. The old theater where they used to lay up, smoking cools in the balcony, tying off a vein with something found on the floor. Or Arkansas, a pair of antlers glued to a cedar board. Which do you want? This or more of the same? All the great dead lie on their back under grass and granite, listening to women sing, dragging their chains. Requiem of thunder, roll on. I really, um, I really love that poem. I guess that's why I read it, but um, especially that ending. And the next poem that I'll, I'll read is, it's called The Choice by Franz Wright. And um, I've been listening to um, this podcast, The Organist, and they have um, a small special, it's like an hour long special on Franz Wright. And it's called Two Years with Franz Wright. He kind of obsessively just recorded himself thinking, writing poems, and it's someone sort of like going through those. and. So I've always loved Franz, right? But it's being reignited by uh, hearing his voice in some of those recordings. The choice. When you look at the sky, when you look at the stars, God is not there. Someone in hell is sitting beside you on the train, somebody burning unnoticed walks past in the street. 
sailors in snow. God can do what is impossible, but God can only do what is impossible. Sad, incurable gift. Thing about that poem is, you know, I'm a teacher. So I always think about how I could teach a poem. And sometimes I just say, oh, you just, there's nothing to teach besides this. It's just a gift. Um, and the next two poems that I'm going to read are from my book that's coming out in June. And the book is split up into two sequences. So they're just kind of like pieces of the whole. Uh, so it's from the vault. This is the title of the book. The inexplicable whole. The it without antecedent. The fog that forms like a father disintegrating in a purple chair. Who am I without my clothes and friend? My linen. Snow on the ocean, unseen. On the coldest day of this November, we made a day of it. It laid there for hours as our mice crept into the stove. Little wave in thought, blank architecture that holds me. This is a little song in the moonstruck snow. Thank you, for I haven't been patient as promised. Thank you for the desperate Hopper-esque light. There is so little to hold, I said, as I held it. Each bloom of strength that entered my hands. And this next poem is by Larry Levis. Um, it's one of the small prose poems. So they don't get that much attention. So I'd like to read them here. And it's called In a Country. My love and I are inventing a country which we can already see taking shape as if wheels were passing through yellow mud. But there is a problem. If we put a river in the country, it will thaw and begin flooding. If we put the river on the border, there will be trouble. If we forget about the river, there will be no way out. There is already a sky over that country waiting for clouds or smoke. Birds have flown into it too. Each evening, more trees fill with their eyes and what they see we can never erase. One day it was snowing heavily and again we were lying in bed watching our country. We could make out the wide river for the first time, blue and moving. We seemed to be getting closer we saw our wheel tracks leading into it and curving out of sight behind us. It looked like the land we had left, some smoke in the distance, but I wasn't sure. There were birds calling, the creaking of our wheels. And as we entered that country, it felt as if someone was touching our bare shoulders lightly and for the last time. And I'll read 
two more poems. Um, this is one of my own. It's also from the vault. Pull back the chaos like a dancing star or a blanket. No gift but the absence followed by song. Twilight map with no river, though there's a river in earshot, like a dream of home. Together, we tested the water. Now, saw Dade as you explained it. Here I am, Lord so far from your ocean confession the shard of porcelain rings in every room and part of the idea of the vault in a sense is um from genesis where this there's a vault between the waters of heaven and the waters of the earth so this idea of like having a shard of that sort of piece of separation um, is something that, you know, I've been interested in or was interested in um, in writing. And the last poem that I'll read and thank you all for, you know, spending your Sunday with us. Um, it's called The Romantic Dogs by Roberto Bolaño. And it's a, a collect the collection. It's the title poem of the collection. And my friend gave it to me at, you know, an interesting time in my life in my twenties. And, you know, I always still feel real close to the live wire uh, of poetry. And this poem sort of reminds me of that moment uh, that I return to when I'm you know, sitting down to write. The romantic dogs. Back then, I'd reached the age of 20 and I was crazy. I'd lost a country, but won a dream. As long as I had that dream, nothing else mattered. Not working, not praying, not studying in morning light alongside the romantic dog. And the dream lived in the void of my spirit. A wooden bedroom cloaked in half light, deep in the lungs of the tropics. And sometimes I'd retreat inside myself and visit the dream. A statue eternalized in liquid thoughts, a white worm writhing in love, a runaway love, a dream within another dream, and the nightmare telling me, you will grow up. You'll leave behind the images of pain and of the labyrinth, and you'll forget. But back then, growing up, would have been a crime. I'm here, I said, with the romantic dogs. And here, I'm going to stay. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you, Andres. Um, that was such an eclectic uh, mix of poems. I've, I've read some CD right, but I don't recall that particular poem that was that was really powerful. I, I appreciate that selection. I do have a sense though that you could read me um, the phone book and make it poetic. <laughs> so I appreciate the the curation, but um, the performances were, were great as well. You had a couple lines that sort of resonated with me as, you know, I, I think about the last, you know, 12 to 14 months and, and what we've all been experiencing. Um, when the interior puzzled with the physical world, I cut myself down um, in your first poem. And then later from one of the poems in the vault, thank you for I haven't been as patient as promised. I think that second line uh, definitely resonated with, with me and uh, how I treat myself and, and others uh, these days. All right. Um, 
Up next is Krista Franklin, who hails from Chicago. Krista, um, as Aaron, as you, I don't know if you saw the, the paintings in, in Aaron's background, but Aaron is, is also a visual artist. Krista is a visual artist. Um, for those few Ian Haley Pollock fans out there, um, you'll recognize Krista's artwork from the cover of my first collection, uh, Spit Back a Boy. This is some of her collage work. Um, all right, Krista, come on down. Hello. Thank you, Ian. Thank you so much to Solstice and FA program. Thank you to my fellow readers, Aaron and Andres, for those gorgeous readings. Um, you know, I don't follow directions well. <laughs> so I'm going to read a few things for myself and I'll mix in the mix um, a couple of other poems from other poets who I'm in community with, uh, people whose work is moving me right now and um, who I think about uh, and have been thinking about recently in writing. So um, I'm going to open, I think, with my piece and forgive me, Amber, because I'm throwing a couple of um, things in the mix <laughs> that I didn't send you. Because, <laughs> you know, I don't follow directions well. Um, so here we go. I'm going to open with a poem of my own. It's from a book called Under the Knife. Uh, what information? is passed through a genetic line. What memories are housed in our cells? Are our memories the memories of some memories of some long dead unknown ancestors along the line? What traumas do we carry that we picked up along the way that were never ours to begin with? This poem is by Meta Sama. It's a poem from her book, Swing at Your Own Risk, and it's called Extinguish Me. Dear striated syntax, button buckle knot strap, letters strumpeth me. Composition me a viscid bitch. Leaves rasp and ornate frankly, hungered for fairy tales to lull the neighbor how lines and lines of not. Bridges decapitate air the way Jane loved Dick, a dog and a mulberry bush. Compounded, too many words will kill. Complex compounded. A woman says the sky is close enough to touch, but when I reach for stratus, my hands graze power. Dear grammar, compressed. I don't remember how to cite signs. A man digs into ground, releases smoke, grieves. I place a comma behind his action, a parenthesis around the voluble pain. Dear grammar, I only want to punctuate this properly. Instinctively yours, X, X. O, O, Y, Y. Somewhere over a cosmic rainbow. This is one of my pieces. 1952 was the year in which I looked out my window chewing gum while reading Henry Dumas' Arc of Bones. And there was a courtyard that people on earth already tired from a late night and the hypnotic monotone of stars couldn't see and they were angry and bewildered. Standing among the lilies in the courtyard was a fellow who pointed south to Alabama. His face was a mask and he raged on and on about dates, places, names, culture in the United States and the dead of history. The past, he said, was dead. He was both prophesying about children, old folks, winos, ants, snakes, and slugs, and about harmonic configuration. He was markedly down to earth. I was riveted. He was out there for, for hours and I went down to join him. A lecture might begin with satirical history and an occasional brief mention of his position on something he read or heard on the radio. Behold the vastness of music, a light for revelation, and a sight of creativity. Allness and the greater neverness, the composition in bells, ancient Egyptian gong, space harp, 
organ, solar bells, dragon drum, space flute, space, and changes on trumpet for verbal improvisation. He was drawn to the incredible. Though extraordinarily rooted with a sense of the cosmological, he observed, harmonious peace is music. So are silences. Each silence, emptiness through which stars and celestial music discourse into interplanetary melody, drum, boom, bap, like black folk into outer space blooms. He appeared to think. We must not forget transposition, 12 bar blues and meta spirit, deep, deep south, and UFO experiences, May 22, 1914 for the MTV cameras on May 30th, 1993. Sun harp, Egyptian sun and spaceships, thousands of them. Transposition always results in a whirling black folk say and science fiction, chaos is music and cosmic philosophy. Music is light and darkness, the ultra dimension of being. People who were milling about on the street ignored him. They didn't see nothing. A policeman with a hidden agenda shot something like bullets. Leave the motherfucker alone, I screamed, at the cost of being perceived slightly out of kilter. And suddenly, Salvador Dali came and offered his own brief interpretive mythological material in straightforward interplanetary harmony. Loneliness was a Lee motif. The fellow interrupted with the ardor of one who was the leader of the angelic choir. Yeah, a spaceship coming on alto sax, spiral mellophone, space drum, and an arc which carries the bones of my father's 54 Chevy. He sung and hummed and he would laugh at people on earth saying, I had some relatives named that. I was living in Chicago at that time. In the future, and even as of now, we travel the whole experience, black is space passages in heavens, each spaceport a tangible spiritual community, levels of history, a tale, a story in which a world all of its own reimagined as music from the world of tomorrow. His conversations and its metaphases like a Frederick Douglass or even an interplanetary Marie Laveau were richly layered and printed on my brain. The effects were strong indeed. I watched him begin to float overhead as he said, next stop is Jupiter. And as I waved goodbye, standing on a park bench among the lilies in the courtyard, he told me to warn Dumas to be careful. That piece is a um, construction. <laughs> it's a construction actually that I wrote years ago for uh, Colleen Smith. I constructed it from passages, randomly selected um, words and lines and passages from a biography um, by Zed, uh, Zwed about Sun Ra. I'm gonna read a poem by a poet by the name Joy Priest. And this is from her book, Horsepower. I read this poem this week and loved it, fell in love. So I'm gonna read this to you guys. My father teaches me how to handle a pistol. Twin Rugers resting side by side on the emerald felt for the good times, playing low through evening's kitchen. As he takes them apart and puts them back together, how can I know what he's remembering as he shoves one grip first into my hesitant hand and swallows the last of the Malbec, his stained lips cracking into a rare, authentic smile. He cannot imagine the first gun I held belonged to a boy who loved me too much when he pointed in my way. Can I know I'm still holding its lead back with the force of my eyes, where my father says his grandmother, Elsie, lives now to terrorize him. I think about her working those molten fields, how tough she must have been living alone with two of the meanest men in our family of mean men. When I learn how tough it is to pull back on the slide, I think of her. Pretty yellow Negro, the men say. So poor, her mule had no name. Its ribs visible across the field where, the, where she stood watching her father-in-law, Spence, beat blood and foam from it. 
When I learn to lock the lever and look down the chamber, I think of her. Oiled pistol, exhausted at her dirt stained thigh. Hand on her hip, insouciant and tired, just tired. Don't ever put your finger on the trigger unless you're ready to pull it, my father says. So I keep it straight. Learn what she was tested by to get eyes old enough to hold a bullet still. Marie says, bow down. This poem is a kind of rumor. It's a rumor that I read about Marie Laveau. It's a retelling of a rumor. And it's also a spell. Marie says, bow down. What I long for is the sound of the drums, the hollow pounding of callous palms pinking against the dry stretched hide of sacrifice. It's shocking to think about time rolling back, planets spinning retrograde. The fingertips of those women, men, scarred, thick skin, tough as cured jerky hanging in the smokehouse. I rub my forefinger against my thumb and remember the years between us. Try to imagine their hands as soft as mine. When would that be? How am I? And all the years in between. Imagine they held each other's names in their mouths like overripe cherries, their songs breaking the sun down to dusk, those hands, the thick skin of sacrifice pounding, the taut fur of a skin thing. They were skinned things remembering a time of togetherness, notes scored in blood. I need you to remember with me the drums, their skin, their voices breaking the crystal fragile nerves of their owners, captors, fathers, breaking the veil, conjuring frenzy in infected imaginations. What year is this? Do you know how long the cops have been called? My love, before there were even phones. Can you imagine? Even then, when those tender names were little more than numbers and decimal points in leather bound ledgers that rested on a desk in the den, the only thing that fuels me here is imagination. I stand at the gates, a specter there, watch her in all white. The officer insists she break it up, the drums, the song, the black mass of spirit thick in the heat. I need you to imagine with me the heat, his pinking face wet, his nerves fragile as Waterford, her an all white haze, her free woman hands smooth and soft as mine, lifting lightly like the wand of a conductor, standing before a symphony, his uniform stiff blue, his pink face reddening like the sun at dusk, his knees buckling under her mouth, an incantation, his thoughts, a murder of crows, a small wave of rejection, her tongue, an ocean of ancestors spelling him into animal, into all fours, into all bark, and no bite. Imagine that moment, the drum, the song, his whoop. This next poem is um, Bernard Lavoie. Foreman, a good friend of mine, is from her latest book, Salt Body Shimmer. We live best in the spaces between two loves. Trinidad, Cuba, 2017. Sun drunk and bruised, we stop for mango juice so sweet it jolts the tooth. Chicken scurry beneath our legs, peck at cartilage and scraps of bones, C and J laugh, cannibalismo. Push Kainito halves into the plate ledge, one for each of my palms slow. I thumb the pits loose, cradle the etymology thick and viscous in the valley of my tongue. Purple star apple, golden leaf, abiaba, pome lule, estrella, aguai, milk fruits. My little lobe glows warm and fat, curled around a blurred past life. Violet nights exhausting my dizzy tongue beside offerings. Stiff petals, moon, blood, and stone. I've come here to clear a vision of myself and let it be true. 
this useless imperial language with one word for hunger, one for thirst, ears pressed between veils, straining to hold some silver ephemera, not mine to keep. Uh, maybe I have time for one more. What's it gonna be? Um, I shall read Out of the Woods. This will be my last poem. Out of the Woods. On the way to water, I think, low moan, heat too deep for me to reach, a new noise from a vent in the paper palace. Before I bounce off brick wall begging for a change, the door swings open and unhinges me to the nail. I heard SMH behind me, you not ready. As it turns out, ticks like cops have a taste for black blood. The mosquitoes made a meal of me for weeks. They're walking slurpy. One stuck his straw in my third eye. I spell him struck blind. My friends compile lists of things they never knew. Read me for filth. I say in every language, I don't have the answers. They don't believe me. I stopped buying tickets to the shit show, but no matter the distance, the smell is pervasive. In the woods, I learned baby wolves get high from the scent of hearts bursting on their Instagram feeds. Serotonin is a hell of a drug. In the clearing, I strain to hear the echoes of men whose bodies drag the forest floor. Unfortunately, all the witnesses withered 70 winters ago. Blood is a potent fertilizer. Thank y'all so much. Thanks to everybody that came through today, joining us. Wow, blood is a potent fertilizer. I'm, I'm just, I'm also just struck by the, the drum thunder of the, the Marie Laveau poem and, and how that built. Um, that was, that was a wonderful reading, Krista. Thank you. I love what you did with, with time and, and so many. And you started off um, in the first poem. Are our memories the memories of memories? And just thinking about how, how time works and, and how the human mind works across time. Um, I've loved, uh, I've loved the, the mix of poems we've, we've had today. I think of all the readings we've done, this might be the, the broadest range of different types of, of poems um, that we've seen. I, I don't know if uh, long time listeners will, will agree with me on that. I, I love the, the range and, and diversity and different feelings of, of poems that we've had um, this afternoon. And uh, I'll throw one more into the mix. <laughs> the last reading, um, I, it was you know, another wonderful reading, but it, it was very intense. And my mother was on and uh, you know, I got a text <laughs> basically telling, telling me to stop doing that to her. <laughs> um, so I, I thought uh, uh, for my mother, I'd, I'd read a, a, a somewhat joyful poem or, or a poem that tries to, to balance um, the joyful with with the hurtful, and it's by the undisputed poetic champion of joy, uh, Roske. I also try to throw a little Philly into every reading. Philly's my adopted hometown, and I see some Philadelphians in the audience today. Um, so I'm pretty sure that this poem is, is set in, in Philly. I know Ross lived in, in Philly for a while. Overheard. It's a beautiful day, the small man said from behind me and I could tell he had a slight limp from the rasp of his boot against the sidewalk. And I was slow to look at him because I've learned to close my ears against the voices of passers-by, which is easier than closing them to my own mind. And although he said it, I did not hear it until he said it a second or third time, but he did. He said, it's a beautiful day and something in the way he pointed to the sun unfolding between two oaks overhanging a basketball court on 10th Street made me, too, catch hold of that light, opening my hands to the dream of the soon blooming. And never did he say, forget the crick in your neck, nor your bloody dreams. 
He did not say, forget the multiple shades of your mother's heartbreak, nor the father in your city kneeling over his bloody child, nor the five species of birds this second become memory. No, he said only, it's a beautiful day. This tiny man limping past me with upturned palms, shaking his head in disbelief. I love that poem. I love how it how it um, recognizes the wonder in the world without um, without dis discounting how how hurtful um, and, and how painful the the world can be as, as well. Um, all right, that does it for us today. Thank you um, so much for spending some time uh, at, at this kitchen table. Um, appreciate you spending this hour with us on on a Sunday. Our next kitchen table reading will be the third Sunday um, in June. It will be our one year anniversary. Um, thank you again to the Solstice MFA program for hosting. Uh, bravo and thanks to the poets. If we could get some more love for them in the chat. Uh, thanks to Aaron uh, Quesedo Kimura, Andre Serpa and Krista Franklin. Uh, stay safe out there and I hope to see uh, each of you in the flesh uh, before too long. Thank you. Yeah, poets, if you want to come on and, and wave goodbye. Thank you, Amber. Yo, I forgot to thank Amber. You're I'm welcome. so sorry. <laughs> oh, Amber, you're the best. Thanks so much for interpreting for us. Yeah, thanks, My Amber. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. Wow. Beautiful. Um, yeah, so I'll let folks filter out and then I'll, I'll stop the record and we can, we can hang for a bit. I loved all the poems you, you picked out. I'm, I was genuine when I said like that mix of poems, like hasn't, there's such a, a wide range this time. I loved being introduced to poets I've never heard before. It's a great idea. Yeah. Same here. It was lovely to hear both of you guys read today. Be exposed to your work and some of your influences and people who you're reading. It's nice. Thank you. Yeah. I think I will let you guys hang out. Again, thank you so much for having me. It was 